This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. The topic is email. I'll be talking with Irvin Staub, a psychologist who's written many books upon the subject, and the conversation will begin in a minute. As mentioned, the topic is evil. Irvin Staub, uh, Staub is my guest. He is a psychologist who's written a number of books on the subject of evil. And as I usually do, I like to give people a few minutes to just uh, talk about themselves and the subject at hand. So, Irvin, welcome. And uh, if you could just tell uh, the viewers a little bit about yourself and how you got interested in evil and what the subject's matters have been particularly in some of your books in, the, in that regard. Well, it's easy to understand how I became interested in the subject of evil. Uh, as a young child, at age six, I survived the Holocaust in Hungary. And uh, after that, uh, I survived the Holocaust because some people helped us. Uh, I learned that even in the worst of times, when a lot of people do terrible things, there are some people who will endanger themselves to help others. And that also led me to become interested in goodness. In the course of my long career, now I have studied both the roots of evil, the prevention of evil, and also the roots of goodness and how we can promote goodness in the world. Uh, after that, I lived under communism, and then I escaped from Hungary after the revolution there in 1956. I came to the United States. I, I studied here. I got a PhD at Stanford. Then at Harvard, I started to do research on what leads people to help others. And for a number of years, I studied that. And then it was clear that very often, uh, people, when help is needed, do not help others and remain passive bystanders. And so I moved on from the question of passivity to the question of perpetration. Uh, what leads people to do terrible things to others? And I started to study the Holocaust and then genocide in general. And having studied the roots of such terrible violence, and later on also mass violence of other kinds, including terrorism, including um, violent conflict. I became very interested in how we can prevent this, and also how after violence has taken place, we can promote reconciliation in order to prevent new violence. So I worked on these issues, both as an academic studying it, and also in the real world. I worked for many years in Rwanda, and we have projects in Rwanda, Burundi, and the Congo, and now my associates have moved on to uh, uh, South Sudan, working on trying to prevent new violence by promoting reconciliation between groups. Um, so that's basically the short history. The principles that I have developed and what I came to understand, I thought were also relevant to um, terrorism. So when terrorism became an important issue, I wanted to understand what leads people to engage in such terrorist acts, uh, what leads them to engage in acts that inflict great harm on civilians, on innocent people. And so I also studied that and uh, looked at radicalization and how that might be prevented. So uh, uh, these are just in a brief outline some of the things that I have done. I have written a, a whole bunch of books about evil. Uh, first, I wrote books about goodness. And then I wrote an, a book called uh, The Roots of Evil. Uh, the origins of genocide and other violent and, and other mass violence, and then another book, the psychology of good and evil, why children, adults, and groups help and harm others, and then a book, overcoming evil, genocide, violent conflict, and terrorism, and my most recent book, uh, published last year, is the roots of goodness and resistance to evil mm. the roots of goodness and resistance of evil and it has a long subtitle uh, inclusive caring uh, moral courage altruism born of suffering active bystandership and heroism 
Well, uh, that's quite a quite a, an impressive resume. Uh, let me. Uh, we'll talk about the roots of evil and some of the the sort of building blocks, if you want to call them, of evil. How you know a child may turn out to be a serial killer or, or something uh, a bit later. But uh, I wanted to uh, go back to your early roots when you were young. Were you actually in a death camp, or were you uh, were you spared that? No, I was not in a death camp. Uh, I was. Uh, uh, you, you, you may have heard about Raoul Wallerford, yeah, the Swede, who, after about four hundred fifty to five hundred thousand people were taken to Auschwitz from Hungary, crammed into wagons and moved to Auschwitz, and most of them were killed right away. Well, in Hungary, the people who were first gathered and moved on to Auschwitz were people from the countryside. And then the Nazis begin to move, and their Hungarian allies, I must add, need to move towards Budapest. And uh, Roy Wallenberg was asked to come to Hungary in order to try to save lives. Uh, his actions were one of the things that have inspired me because he was not a diplomat. He was a regular citizen, uh, a poor member of a rich family. And he was asked to come to Hungary and act as a diplomat and try to save lives. And he came and he, with great ingenuity, did many things to save Jewish lives. And he succeeded in saving many lives. And one of the things that he did was he created the so-called protective pass, passes that said that these people are going to become Swedish citizens after the war, and after the war, and they are under the protection of Sweden. And the Hungarian government allowed at that time for him to create four thousand of these documents, but he created many more of them. And he set up these so-called protected houses where people with these documents could move into. Now, these houses were only very, well, they weren't well protected in that there were constant raids on these houses, mainly by Hungarian Nazis, the so-called Arrow Cross. And they would come and they would look through the house and anybody who in any way didn't fit the criteria of these productive passes, they would take away. Uh, so one of the people actually who survived with us was my father, who was in a forced labor camp. And when his group was being taken to Germany on a pass, on a stayover for a night in Budapest, he escaped and he knew the address because another person who was extremely helpful to us, a Christian woman who before the war worked for my family and remained with us and helped us in many ways, went to this forced labor camp, took a copy of this protective pass, asked someone at the fence to call my father to come there and gave him a copy of this. Uh, this was not really helpful to him because people in his situation, men of his age, were not protected. These pa protective passes did not apply to them. But this may have given him the courage to escape. And he came to where we were, and he was hiding there. And at one time there was a raid on the house. Uh, I saw from the window a group of black uniformed men marching down the street and they came into our house and my mother apparently maybe he had she had this design before maybe she decided on the spur of the moment but she asked my father to sit down in the corner of the room pushed an armchair over him threw a blanket over the armchair and these men looked everywhere in that apartment and didn't find him they pulled out drawers, they looked into closets, and he survived. So uh, we were very lucky to survive. And while for a long time, this did not make me think about how I could try to understand this or do anything about it. You know, I was a young child. I went about my life trying to survive. Uh, 
I faced anti-Semitism in Hungary while I was growing up. But once I began my academic career, uh, a friend of mine was studying rescuers, the first person who studied rescuers of people in the Holocaust. Rescuers is a term that was used for people who, at the time of a genocide, attempt to save lives, endangering themselves, and often also endangering their children and their families. Uh, because the consequences of doing this could be very severe. So he studied these people, and uh, this inspired me. And when I got to Harvard, my first job, I started to do experimental research on sharing and helping. I was trained at Stanford to be an experimental researcher, and so I was doing that for a number of years until I shifted and began to study genocide on a large scale and then other kinds of violence also on a large scale. Well, let me just uh, ask you uh, one more biographical question before we move on to the topic more formally. Uh, you mentioned that uh, after the war you had lived for over a decade in Hungary when uh, it fell behind the Iron Curtain. So you've gotten... Uh, some first-hand experience in your life of what, what a lot of historians here in the West would consider the two great evils of the 20th century, fascism, specifically Nazism, and communism. Uh, is there any, have you studied any of the similarities between the systems, the differences? Uh, was communism, say, more uh, subtle in its evil than Nazism, whereas Nazism was a brutal fist and, and communism was maybe a, a knife to the back? What, what were the what can you say about those two systems of government? Well, as you are saying this, yes, there are definitely similarities. Um, both believed in great violence to support their cause. The great violence was more evident in the Soviet Union than in Hungary, although in Hungary there was also violence. Uh, people came to someone's apartment late at night, took that person away, the person disappeared, but the scale of it was much smaller than in the Soviet Union, where the scale was quite large. So there were similarities, idealizing violence in order to fulfill an ideology. Both of them had what I call a destructive ideology, and there are many influences that lead to great violence, but an important one is such an ideology. And that ideology can be an ideology that imagines the well-being of the group. It could be nationalism, or it can be it can imagine the well-being of all human beings. Communism had the vision of improving the well-being of all humanity over the long run. But what makes it destructive is that they identify enemies who stand in the way. Yeah. And these enemies have to be, so to speak, dealt with. And sometimes dealing with these enemies means uh, killing all of them. Sometimes it means killing some of them and imprisoning a large number of them, or maybe trying to re-educate them. So there are various avenues to dealing with this identified group that is regarded as standing in the way of fulfilling this beautiful vision of the ideology. So that is definitely something that is shared between communism and, uh, and uh, Nazism. And, you know, if you look at places like um, Cambodia, <clears throat> where there was also a genocide, uh, it was guided by a communist ideology, the vision of a better world, a vision of a better society, but very frequently, interestingly, and certainly in Cambodia, but also in the Soviet Union, there is an intermingling of this ideology for a better world, better society, and also nationalism. So it was very clear in the case of um, uh, Cambodia that uh, they were trying to recreate the greatness of Cambodia as a nation. You know, centuries before, Cambodia was a large country, powerful, influential, economically very well off, and they were trying to create the greatness of it. And they were also acting against not only people whom they regarded as not being able 
by their background and experience to go along with the communist system, uh, actually acting against everybody, trying to re-educate everybody, but also against what they considered a historical enemy, which was uh, Vietnam. And it was their incursions into violence against Vietnam that brought them down, because then Vietnam moved into Cambodia and ended the Khmer Rouge regime. But I, I just want to point out that while all this was going on, the rest of the world was passive. Vietnam, because it was attacked by Cambodia, moved into Cambodia. But while the Cambodians, the Khmer Rouge, were killing a large number of Cambodians and enslaving the whole population, Nobody was doing anything. And this is very common. Yeah. When there is great violence, usually most everybody remains passive. Well, let me let me ask you uh, about, uh, since we're talking about mass evils, and we'll get to more individuated, uh, smaller evils later. Um, do you think, because it seems from what you've said, violence is at the root of what most would consider evil, and human beings were certainly violent before they even had political systems. Um, do you think that Nazism or communism or feudalism or or colonialism, any of these things that we now consider to ha have created mass violence over this, the last few centuries, do you think that it's motivated uh, that the ideology comes first and that violence is the tool that's applied to impose that ideology, or do you think that there's sort of this... Uh, remnant uh, violence within people that gets its expression through the ideology? In other words, which do you think comes first, the, the violence or the ideology? Well, I think the ideology comes first. I don't personally believe that there is violence within people necessarily. I believe that genetically we have the potential both for being violent, violent and for being caring and cooperative. Uh, and our experience shapes that. Now, there are two kinds of experience that shape that. One of them is our experience in the course of growing up and in the course of our individual experience in the course of our lives. So, for example, a, a child who is abused, who is very badly treated, comes to see other people in a negative way, comes to see other people as hostile, comes to see other people as dangerous, and when they have the capacity, they often strike out against others. And they may strike out partly because they very easily feel the need that they need to defend themselves since they were harmed so often, or they may also strike out because they develop a feeling of hostility and anger towards others. Now, when it comes to groups of people, how individuals are raised and their experience matters, but social conditions matter a great deal. Culture and social conditions are very important. In many societies, for a very long period of time, some groups have been devalued. Now, why have they been devalued? Uh, they may have been devalued because they belong to some way, a different group. We easily differentiate. Oops. It's just all so, something happened. I don't know what happened. I can, I can I, still hear and see you. I disappeared. No, I can still see you. You can see me? Yeah, go on. I, I cannot see myself. Okay. Um, I don't know why that is, but... <laughs> Anyway, so, so social conditions, uh, so culture matters. They may come to devalue others. You know, we easily draw lines between us and them. And that is one of the other great sources of violence against others. Uh, we draw these lines and then the other can be easily devalued, uh, seen in a negative light. Uh, and we become hostile to them. And cultures devalue groups of people, sometimes because of these differences, sometimes just because, you know, these people are different in some way or because they are poor, and so the rich devalues the poor and there is mutual hostility or whatever. Then certain life conditions in a society have a great effect. Economic deterioration, 
is a very important source. Political confusion, social chaos in a society give rise to very important needs in people, frustrate important needs. Everybody wants to feel secure. Everybody wants to feel good about themselves, have a somewhat positive identity. Uh, when you cannot provide for your family and you cannot feel that you can protect your family, then your identity is affected. We want to feel connected to other people and difficult conditions and social chaos and economic deterioration affects, affect a sense of connection to other people. Uh, we want to feel effective that we can influence our lives and we can affect our fate. And so that matters a great deal. And under these conditions, people cannot do that. So what happens under these difficult, problematic, challenging conditions of life is that people begin to scapegoat others. Yeah. Why are these things happening? It is because of some other group. And often this is a group that has been historically already devalued, maybe a minority in society. Uh, then uh, scapegoating can move into this ideology that is protective to the group. The present is bad, but we see a more positive future. And so we want to create this positive future. And then when you see some group as when you scapegoat in some group as standing in the way of this, then you turn against that group. So the social conditions, the culture, as they combine and their psychological effects on whole groups of individuals are very powerful. And what happens is not a sudden flare up of extreme violence. Violence usually involves, this is true of individuals, it's true of groups. A uh, group begins to harm another, devalue the other more, discriminate more, begins to small acts of violence, and these have to be justified. Why are we doing this? We are doing this because of who these people are and what they have done, and it is justified and it is right. So progressively, we exclude them from the human realm. We come to see we, that we engage sometimes what I call a reversal of morality. Usually we learn that it is unacceptable and bad to harm others and especially kill others. But for some people under these conditions, killing others becomes the right thing because we are do this for we are doing this for the group, we are doing this for a higher purpose, and so this is the right thing to do. And so this in addition to social conditions and their psychological effects, this evolution is what can lead to extreme violence. And you find this kind of evolution also on an individual level. You know, people who abuse their spouses, their partners, often start at a smaller level. Mm. They do some more minor thing. They derogate that person in words. And then finally, at some point, they end up hitting that person. And then it goes on to more extreme violence. And again, along the way, this is justified by the presumed wrongdoings of this other person. And, you know, the, another aspect of evil is how parents may treat their children. Uh, uh, you know, the thing is, to me, evil means doing extreme harm to others. Yeah. But extreme harm can be the result of many small actions. Yeah. So, disregarding children, derogating them, uh, punishing them inappropriately uh, can all be the sources of children feeling belittled, children feeling incapable of anything, children not able to access positive emotions. And, and you know, one other thing about evil is that it does not have to be intentional. I still consider it evil. What do I mean by that? Well, for many years, 
over a long period of time, the 17th, 18th, 19th century, even in the 20th century early on, uh, parents were told that children need to learn obedience at an early age. Yeah. In particular in Germany, this was done very intensely in books telling children, parents how to raise children, they were told that it is important to break the will of the child at an early age so that they will be obedient. And any means can be used for that purpose. Uh, the children can be physically punished early on, they can be threatened by the devil and by policemen and so on. Uh, and all this would have a really negative effect. So. The parents didn't think they were doing anything bad. They were thinking that they were doing something good, something right. But the thing is that it, the consequences were extreme harm very often. Uh, and it's also that it is discoverable that this was harmful. It was not impossible to realize the negative effects of this, but still, they thought that they were doing something good, they were guided to it. And, you know, the same thing with group violence. Uh, usually, the means are regarded as justified to accomplish some wonderful ends, like the fulfillment of this good ideology. And uh, leaders can promote this and move the group towards them. But it is the combination of leaders and followers and passive bystanders that makes leaders make evil likely and possible. Well, let me just ask you this, uh, and I'll end this first segment here uh, talking about me evil on a sort of macro social level. Um, I would think, and correct me if I'm wrong, that most people would ascribe that the social evil violence stemmed from, say, bands of cavemen arguing over resources in a jungle, in a forest, the, the clear stream and whatnot. But in modern times, at least since we've had history, uh, we've had groups, as you mentioned, being persecuted for, for things that really had nothing to do with resources. For example, here in the United States of America, uh, the two most persecuted groups have been Native Americans and blacks that were imported in slavery from, uh, from Africa. And they look quite a bit different than Europeans, so they are the other in terms of looks. Whereas Jews, for example, in Europe, were often indistinguishable uh, from uh, Hungarians or Germans or French or whatnot, and uh, so, but they were—they seem to have been targeted for their cultural success in in different areas, and that they they had a they had a cultural bind that was hard work, and this is how you succeed in life, and this caused resentment. So, is there any mechanism? What? How did? How did this uh, hatred of the other? in terms of competing over resources in early hunter-gatherer societies, sort of morph into this more uh, deeper hatred on surface level things like looks or the success of a group? Well, I think we need to start with a tendency to differentiate between us and them. Yeah. And uh, that has survival rules. Uh, when small groups lived in a certain area and they were competing with other groups, then their group survival depended on having resources, having food, having territory in which there was food, there were animals, they could hunt and so on. So there would be competition between groups. and. Uh, so a basis of this, you know, then became a differentiation between who we are and who those people are. And so our whole cognitive system developed in such a way that we can draw these distinctions easily between us and them. You know, young children uh, um, at, at, at age six or so begin to develop at six months or so begin to develop stranger anxiety. What is that based on? It is based on their becoming familiar with certain people and others are unfamiliar. Now, what's interesting about stranger anxiety is that the more people are these young infants exposed to, 
the less the stranger anxiety. So stranger anxiety is dependent on some inbuilt mechanisms that we developed in the course of evolution, but also is affected greatly by experience. And the more kids maintain this differentiation between us and them because of their experience and because of the way they are raised, and so this differentiation between us and them is often intensified by parents and adults. So there is a natural tendency, can be overcome by experience to some degree, but it can be intensified by limited experience and by adults pointing to the other in a negative way. And so it's perfectly possible to imbue prejudice just on the basis of communications to others. You know, at some period of time, people were writing about the anti-Semitism in Japan. Well, that's interesting, isn't mm. it? Because probably there are no Jews in Japan. Yeah. <laughs> there are, you know, most Japanese have never met one. But uh, through communication and through providing a negative image, because we are such symbolic human beings, because we are such people of ideas, we can create this kind of negativity. So it is a combination of genetic potential and experience, both direct experience and experience through education and information that can create very strong prejudice. And you know, you can create these things non-verbally also. A parent walks down the street with a young child, and the young child sees a beggar, a man, doesn't know, he or she doesn't know this is a beggar, but sees a child on the side of the street, sitting on the ground, and maybe with a sign saying, I need such and such. And the child wants to approach that person sitting on the ground, and the adult continues to walk and drags the child away and along with him or her. A few times of these, and it's so powerful, it communicates so much. Yeah. Children learn very fast. The behavior of adults, their example. Now, one of the one of the contributors to rescue, which I mentioned, means people endangering themselves to try to save the lives of people who are, are potential victims of genocide. And there have been rescuers, by the way, in every genocide. Rescuers in Nazi Europe, rescuers in Rwanda, rescuers in Turkey. And in the largest study of rescuers, uh, it was found that one of the influences on rescuers was that their family did not differentiate as much between the in-group, let's say Polish Catholics, and the odd group, others who lived in Poland, including Jews. And they engaged more with these people, and they had relationships more with these outsiders. And the children growing up in these families were more likely to become rescuers. So this is a very powerful source of violence, and it can also be a very powerful source when it is not demonstrated if the opposite is shown if people don't do us and them but reach out to the other it can be also a powerful source of caring and positive behavior well let's end it right there as far as talking about uh, uh sort of uh, mass social evil in this segment and on next segment i want to come back and sort of talk about the building blocks of evil how an individual's free will and their agency plays a role in whether they do something evil or something good. And we will return in a moment to talk about that. I'm back talking with Irvin Staub about uh, evil. And we spent uh, the first uh, half of our, our show here talking a little bit more about the bigger mass evils, genocide and, and things. But uh, I've always been of the belief that for every 
rape or murder, something that on even on an individual level can be considered a bondal, there are 10,000 little things that happen in a day that are evil. You have a boss who abuses a worker. You have a landlord that treats, you know, one of their renters terribly. Uh, someone is indifferent or cruel to someone unnecessarily because of this, that, or the other thing. So I wanted to talk about the individual, the individual human being and their reaction to good or evil and what creates them. And uh, in the break, I was just mentioning there are uh, some famous experiments that have been done uh, since the Second World War to talk about uh, whether a person makes a choice to do good or evil. And uh, three of the most famous of them, I just want to run by you and get your uh, ideas about them. Probably the earliest one was Stanley Milgram, who did uh, a series of experiments in which uh, uh, it sort of weighed whether people were swayed by an authoritarian figure in which they, I think, would press a button and they'd hear someone screaming supposedly in pain. No one was really in pain. But to what degree that person would follow uh, the instructions of the authoritarian figure in pressing that button and, and seemingly doing harm to someone. What do you think of that experiment? Some people have thought that that was... Uh, not a good scientific experiment, that maybe it was unethical. What are your thoughts on that experiment, and what do you think that says about human nature? Well, it's true that there are some ethical questions that have been raised and legitimately raised about it. But, you know, at the time when the experiment was done, uh, it was considered acceptable. Uh, Now, it's less so. But that doesn't mean that the experiment is not valid. Uh, Those were important experiments. Uh, It showed that when people are told by a person who acts as an authority, as a scientist, to administer shocks to another person who makes mistakes on a learning task. And the purpose of the shocks was to improve supposedly that person's learning and they were told to increase the level of shocks and continue to increase it to a very high level where on the machine it's a danger and then uh, depending on the conditions there were many of them there was nothing or sounds of distress from an adjoining room a person shouting and saying oh i have a heart problem don't do this or sometimes the person who was supposedly receiving the shocks, they didn't really receive them, uh, they were an actor, they were actors, yeah. uh, were sitting right next to the person administering it, and this person had to take that other person's hand and put it on the shock machine and then administer the shock. So the closer the person was, and there were sounds of distress by the person, the fewer, the smaller the percentage of the people who administered the shocks. Uh, so even under the most distant condition, there is no sound, there is no anything, you are just administering shocks uh, on a signal. About 69% of the people did it, 31% didn't do it. Um, in the course of that also, people were doing what I said earlier, talked about earlier, they were devaluing the, the learner, the so-called learner, the teachers were devaluing the learner, you know, why is this person so stupid and why can't he answer more appropriately and so on. Now, the question that has been raised about this is interpretation. What does this mean? Stanley Milgram suggested that this is a metaphor for the Holocaust. He was motivated by the Holocaust. And he said that it was possible for the Holocaust to happen because people were obeying authority. I have studied genocide all my life, and my understanding of this is that a lot of what happened was not simply obedience to authority. In societies where there is overly strong respect for authority, where people are raised to obey authority, and then 
because of social conditions and various other things, they come to tend to obey authority. That's one of the contributors of the likelihood of genocide, one of a variety of contributors. It makes it more likely. Uh, but it is not a single determinant. And also, many people join an ideological movement voluntarily that is moving towards increasing violence and genocide. So uh, it's an element leading to violence, especially large-scale group violence, but it is not a primary determinant of that kind of violence. Uh, uh, so that's, that's, that's my take okay. on, 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 this, on this story. Well, let me ask, did Milgram uh, know the ethnic backgrounds of the people that he studied? For example, were black people who, who may have participated or Jews, were they less likely to be press the button? Or were women, for example, uh, less violent or less apt to press the button than men? Well, I don't actually know whether there were studied with, studies with minorities. Okay. Uh, it is the case that women also engage in this. There were many studies done of this kind. Milgram did many of them, then other people did for a while, other studies. And it looks like um, in different cultures, under varied conditions, people do this. But maybe I should point out two things. One of them is that in one study, people were administered a so-called authoritarian questionnaire they were more likely to follow and obey authorities. And people like that were more likely also to administer these extreme shocks, going all the way. And in another study, people were given a, a moral judgment test. And people who tested in a certain way with a kind of responsibility orientation that they felt morally responsible. This was not the highest level of moral reasoning, but it was a moral reasoning appropriate for the situation. They were substantially less likely to continue to administer these shocks. And by the way, this finding about moral responsibility is very consistent with a lot of research that I have done, which shows that the feeling of responsibility for other people's welfare is one of the important influences that lead people to help others. Whether that person is in physical distress, whether that person is psychological distress, under varied condition, my students and I found that this feeling of responsibility for others' welfare is a very important contributor to help. And it looks like it's also a contributor to inhibit harm. About a decade after the Milgram tests uh, came an even more controversial uh, experiment known as the Stanford Prison Experiment done by Philip Zimbardo. And this is probably even thought of by people nowadays to be even uh, less ethical than the Milgram test. And basically, he got a, a bunch of uh, college students. He had a mock set built, I believe, of... Uh, uh, where he, he sort of randomly chose people who are going to be guards and who are going to be prisoners. And over, I think, a handful of days, uh, uh, basically, they they ran this experiment as though uh, people were imprisoned and to see to what degree brutality would manifest itself in uh, the guards who were, were randomly chosen. Uh, can, can you speak a little bit about that uh a uh, famous uh, experiment, uh, its pros and cons, and what you gathered from it? And Well, I certainly can. Uh, first of all, it, this wasn't an experiment. Yeah. What do I mean? An experiment is in which something is done a number of times, and see when it is repeated, it happens in a similar way again and again. Yeah. And it is compared to some other situation, a so-called control situation, and see if in comparison to that other situation, in this situation, that particular thing happens more. Now, uh, instead of that, this was a single event lasting, I believe, for about six days when it had to be terminated. Mm -hmm because the so-called prisoners became 
so upset and so distressed as a result of the bad behavior of the guards. So, yes, these people, there were tests given to a large number of volunteers who were paid for their participation during a summer in Palo Alto, and then they were picked up by actual police, brought to uh, the Stanford Psychology Department under the basement of that department, <coughs> uh, and, and, and then some people were designated as guards and others as prisoners. And pretty soon the guards begin to harshly treat the prisoners and you know do bad things to them. And 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 the prisoners responded with a kind of riot, and then the guards became harsher, and there were lineups where they had to stand in the middle of the night for a very long time, all kinds of mistreatment. And this had to be terminated after six days because things got so bad. <clears throat> now, what Simbardo was trying to show that the circumstances that exist alone can lead people to behave in a very negative way. So the circumstances were the prison. Now, there were additional circumstances that is very important to consider so that the circumstances were kind of loaded on. One of the additional circumstances was that Zimbardo at the beginning made a speech to the guards, said that we want to really test these people, we want to push them, we want to make their lives difficult. So it wasn't like a well-ordered prison. The other thing that happened was that when these guards engaged in harassment and harsh and punitive behavior, <clears throat> then everything was seen by the supervisors and the warden, which was Philip Zimbardo, the professor who started set this up, and they could see all that was going on, and they took no action. They allowed everything to unfold. So non-supervised, non-trained young people were the guards. Another thing is that there was one particular person and in the group of guards, whom they named John Wayne because of his demeanor and because of his behavior, and he was particularly aggressive against the prisoners. And so there was here also a model or a kind of ringleader that probably he definitely influenced his partner working with him, but influenced probably everything else and affected the climate. And finally, in my book, The Roots of Evil, I put out a hypothesis that the people who volunteer for a study of prison life may be different in their personal characteristics from other people. And many years later, a psychologist, McFarland, and his student decided to conduct a study to test this hypothesis. And in Western Kentucky, they put ads into the newspaper. In some ads, they were looking for people to participate in a psychological study of prison life. In another study, they put an ad in, in other newspapers, they put an ad in which they looked for people to participate in a psychological study. Mm. Prison life was not added. And then they compared these people using a variety of well-established questionnaires. And the people who said that they who volunteered to study, to participate in a psychological study of prison life, were more Machiavell Machiavellian which means they were more manipulative and more hostile to other people. They were less empathic and less caring for others. They also, in some measure, were generally more hostile. So they also went back to the original study in which Zimbardo and his associates 
used questionnaires to establish that these people who participated in the study were normal. They didn't have mental health problems. And maybe they didn't have mental health problems, but actually on some questionnaire, their, I believe it was the Machiavellian orientation, were similar to people in some kind of very serious prison. Mm. So the thing is that from the very beginning, there was obviously some selection, likely some selection process as to who volunteered. And I just want to point out that this was true both of the prison guards and it was true also of the prisoners because it was the same population. So people hostile towards others and less empathic were encountering people hostile towards others and less empathic and it created conflict and then it created greater hostility and greater abuse on the part of the guards. So my conclusions are this. This was a very limited study still it has some valuable information in it because when you look at prison guards there is likely to be some selection there are all cell selection there are also yeah not everybody wants a job as a prison guard and there are a variety of other kinds of jobs in which there is self-selection and if in addition to that self-selection by personal characteristics you add influences and part of the influence is just the power differential between people in authority and people who are at their disposal to use their authority over and part of it is how supervisors treat the situation and how supervisors influence guards and other people in authority, how people hire up, what kind of a system they established, are they working hard to make sure that there are rules and that the rules are followed and people behave in a humane way in situations like prisons or do they not? So all of these things have a little bit of inkling that one gets from this study and one has to see both its limitations and the hypotheses that it can contribute to. Because it wasn't really a study, it's just hypotheses. But it has value, but its value is much more limited than it is usually claimed. And that is the, the way it is described even today in psychology textbooks. Yeah, it's interesting talking about the hierarchy because I was recently uh, re-watching parts of The World at War, the, the documentary on World War II from the BBC or from British Broadcasting, at least back uh, 40 some years ago. And there was an interview with uh, the fellow who was Himmler's right hand man in the SS. And it was interesting to listen to him talk about when they wiped out uh, the SA on the night of long knives and how here you had the SA were basically street thugs in, in and the, but the SS were considered the elite thugs and the elite thugs looked down at the the secondary thugs and had no problem wiping them out as as easily as they did a gypsy or a jew or a communist yes that's right you are, you are absolutely right and that is you know that is really interesting there is a hierarchy clearly among whatever groups including yeah. thugs uh, uh, and uh, the ss were considered by themselves and by others and uh, by by the Nazis as much more elite, so uh, really that that's a good uh, a good example of yeah. uh, this uh, us and them division even among people who are working for the same cause. Right. Um, I want to talk about the the third of the experiments, and this was probably considered the most controversial at the time because it was done with children, and that was Jane Elliott's blue eye brown eye experiment uh, in the late sixties early seventies where. Uh, for a day, she divided her class amongst the blue eyes and the brown eyes, and I believe the blue eyes were considered superior the first day, and on the second day, she reversed it and said, no, it's really the brown eyes who are superior. And just like with the Stanford uh, experiment and, and, and Zimbardo, there were some interesting things there, although I believe in the second day, the brown eyes who had been subjugated on day one were a little bit more empathic than the blue eyes had been when they were on top. If you want to talk a little bit about that uh, that uh, famous uh, yes. thing. Well, you know, that was uh, really uh, 
very interesting demonstration. It's it's like the Stanford prison study, so called. It was a demonstration, and this was a very powerful demonstration. Uh, you know what she did was to tell the children that you know blue-eyed people are clearly better; they are superior, and you can always give examples that support such an argument. So yeah. George Washington. Wasn't he blue-eyed? Mm. And she gave other examples of important, influential figures who were blue-eyed. And, you know, it shows how malleable people are to this kind of influence from another person. And, you know, what happened was that when the situation was created, it created anxiety in the people in the victim or lower or devalued group. And so they performed worse on tasks, tasks of different kinds. They were timed and they were slower, and their performance was worse, and so on. And also, amazingly, this could be reversed, although there was some more empathy. But for me, the point in this that guides us to is the power of socialization. It is possible for parents to create resistance to this. It is possible for parents to make children aware of the forces that create divisions between us and them, that generate hostility towards others, and to work with children to understand that it is possible to resist these forces. You know, a primary work that I have done for many years now is this work in Rwanda and Burundi and the Congo and other places on uh, trying to help people understand the roots of violence, what are the forces that lead to violence, and how it may be prevented and how people may be able to reconcile in order to actually create resistance to forces that may emerge again to create violence. And these forces I mentioned may be social conditions, these forces may be culture, it may be leaders who instigate people to move against others. And apparently our work there, seminars, workshops, and information or radio programs, including a radio drama that has started to broadcast in 2004 in Rwanda and is still ongoing. A story of two villages in conflict and how they turn against each other and then what are the forces that over time lead to reconciliation and inhibit such violence. So the same thing with children and their socialization. And the interesting thing about that program uh, with Elliot that you mentioned was that a number of years later, as the children now were young adults, she had them come back and talk about it. And they talked about it as a powerful experience that helped them understand the roots of prejudice and the importance of resist the influences that lead to prejudice. So this was a painful experience that it had important educational effects. I think the same thing can be accomplished also with less pain. If parents and teachers progressively help children understand these things and have them learn to resist them. Well, I want to now uh, get uh, uh, move a little bit away uh, into a bit more abstract area of evil because um, we've talked about you know the the long litany of uh, uh, human uh, uh, evil and violence towards each other. Um, you know, we have set up as human beings in in most uh, nations, you know, legal systems that protect people, and we've created things called rights and. Uh, um, we, we can talk about rights being, you know, a, a human right or whatnot, but certainly let's say if some alien culture that was far above us decided they wanted to blast Earth out of the orbit and, uh, and destroy it so that they could build some a big superstructure or something, uh, our rights that we recognize would probably not be recognized by them. But I wanted to talk about, you know, in the last 20, 30 years, we've, we've had 
uh, animal rights movements about uh, unnecessary cruelty towards animals and experiments for for different, uh, whether it's cosmetics or for drugs or whatnot. Um, where do you see the idea of, well, what do you think of rights in general, human rights? It's one thing, because there's not that much of a difference between a Filipino, a Jew, a Mexican, a Swede, uh, an Arab, uh, and someone from South Africa. But there's clearly a difference between a human being and a dog and a cat, or a human being and even a gorilla. Um, do you think that the, the, the movement in animal rights is merely an extension of the rights where we've been trying trying to grant human beings? Uh, and do you think that's a good impulse? Well, I do think that it is an extension. Uh, you know, it used to be that we cared about our own group. And, uh, you know, that was our focus. And it took a long time to expand that caring to other people outside our group. Mm -hmm. I talk a lot about inclusive caring, how on the psychological level, we can extend our caring to our humanity. Human rights looks at this in a legal realm and see how we can extend laws that protect human beings everywhere, regardless of who they are, regardless of their ethnic background and origin, that it shouldn't matter what kind of origin you come from, your religion, race, and so on, it still matters what you do. That's important. But not your background in terms of group membership, as far as, as rights concerned and as far as caring is concerned. And I do think that in part, this is probably the extension of those rights to animals, but it's probably also psychological. In the United States, and probably at most places in the world, uh, dogs are the companions of human beings. Mm -hmm. They live with us. People develop great affection for drugs and cats and even for other animals. Children do, you know, they have gerbils and they have guinea pigs and so on. And so emotional connections develop to these animals, especially lonely people, you know. For them, animals can be of great importance. And so then they ask, well, I have this deep connection, and this animal is a creature for me. It's almost a person for me. So why shouldn't these creatures have rights? Why should they be tortured? Why should they be badly treated? Why should they suffer? So it's very understandable from an emotional standpoint, and also from the standpoint of the extension of rights to animals that they should not be made to feel unnecessary pain and suffering. Uh, so it makes sense to me. You know, I have focused in my own work so much on human beings and human lives and try to protect and defend the rights of all human beings to a dignified ex existence, uh, to a good life, that, you know, I haven't focused myself on animals, but it is understandable that this would have happened and this would evolve in that particular way. Especially also today, in this day and age, when we have become so concerned about the climate. And if you think about the climate, which can affect all of us, in a sense, we share the fate that climate can inflict on us with animals. So shared fate is something that creates a psychological connection, a, a more positive orientation toward other beings. And I think that may also be a contributor to this. Well, let me ask another abstract question. I, and I've often 
talk with uh, people about this kind of thing. A lot of people who are on a, a liberal social bent or a liberal political view f feel that evil, when we talk about it, is kind of silly, and they think that evil is sort of something that can be cured the way you could cure a disease, i.e. that you could, uh, if you took a, a serial killer or someone who a would-be terrorist or uh, one of these young spree killers or whatnot, if they just got the proper mental health, if they had just been in the right uh, situation, they wouldn't have been that way. Whereas other people would say, well, you could have taken, you know, Attila the Hun or Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin, and you could have raised them in the lap of luxury, giving, fulfilling all of their needs, but they still would have been evil. Is it your, is it your belief or, or your experience? What side of the coin do you fall on? Do you think that evil is made or that it is, is that it is in, uh, imminent in, in some one or in some psychology or somewhere in between? Uh, I, I very much think that evil, which is not... See, some people think of evil as some kind of an external force, the devil, Lucifer, yeah. whatever, nature. Uh, I don't think that way at all. No. I think that but evil, I believe, is created and evolves, so it can be prevented. Uh, if Hitler had had different socializing experiences. It could have made a huge difference. Even people speculate, and it may be right, it's probably right, that you know he applied to an, an art academy in Vienna, and he wasn't accepted. And his closest friend at that time, who was a musician, was accepted to another a comparable music academy. So that creates prejudice and anger, but also frustration and disappointment and so on. Some think that if he had been accepted to that academy, his whole life course might have been different. But certainly if he had other different socializing experiences, it would have been different. If German culture hasn't hadn't had a very long history of anti-Semitism, it's it was a country where in the Middle Ages, Jews were one of the places where they were most severely treated. And on the turn of the century, uh, uh, the late 1800s, the beginning of 1900s, there was an anti-Semitic party in Parliament that wanted to eliminate all laws that gave Jews rights. So if the culture had been different, if the social circumstances have been different, the loss of war, uh, tremendous losses, uh, a revolution that overthrew the monarchy, which people were very attached to, many people were very attached to, tremendous depression, incredible inflation, the invasion by France, who did not want, who, who demanded more reparations to be paid for the First World War uh, and sabotage in response to them, affecting the German economy. One thing after another after another, if there hadn't been this kind of social chaos and the culture and the individual experiences of Hitler, and also so all this, also the followers in Germany, that people were ready to follow the kind of leader that Hitler was, all of these things contributed to what happened. So different social conditions, uh, different behavior in the international relations. You know, people were identif people identified the peace treaty between the victorious allies and Germany as a very serious problem because it imposed very humiliating and problematic conditions on Germany. Uh, the readiness of followers, as I said, and the passivity of bystanders, the whole world. Look, Hitler came to power in 1933. He immediately turned against social democrats, the labor movement, uh, former communists. He killed a lot of people and then immediately started the persecution of Jews. And in 1936, the whole world went to Berlin to participate in the Berlin Olympics. Okay, maybe a misguided idea that by that they could draw Germany into the international community. 
But during the 1930s, when there were increasing persecution of Jews and increasingly extreme authoritarian actions by Hitler's Germany, the corporations of the United States and other countries were very busy in Germany doing business. So basically, what does that say? It says to people, we accept what you are doing. When in 1938, Roosevelt, who actually didn't allow most of the Jews who could have come under the already existing quotas to come to Germany, he initiated a conference in Evian, Switzerland, where many countries came together to talk about allowing Jews to come in there. And they decided not to allow Jews from Germany, refugees from Germany, to come into their countries. The propaganda minister of Germany, of the Nazi propaganda minister, wrote in his diary, they would all like to do to the Jews what we are doing, except they don't have the courage. So many conditions in the life of nations and also in the life of individuals contribute to great destructiveness. Now to reverse this, to prevent this, is a very challenging effort. Children could be raised with positive socialization, but who are the people who are to raise them? It's adults. So adults have to change first. And in adult, in order, order to adult, for adults to change, the social conditions in a society have to change. You know, great poverty and discrimination affect people's lives very negatively. And this, in turn, is likely to affect how they treat and socialize their children. So, you know, it has to be a kind of many-faceted process at many levels to create the conditions and the experiences for people that makes them understand what leads to extreme violence or extremely harmful actions, even if they are not violent, less against children, and to begin to reverse the processes and create positive processes, create processes in a society of equal justice, of no discrimination, of acknowledging and valuing people's life, of cooperation among individuals and groups, of institutions in which people feel that they are respected, and all these different things. And bystanders, you know, we are talking about perpetrators. But I think that under certain conditions, passive bystanders are also evil. I mean, think of situations in which one parent abuses a child mm -hmm. and the other mm -hmm. parent remains passive in the face of it. One parent is physically punishing a child very harshly and severely and the other parent doesn't do anything. One parent sexually abuses a child and the other parent pretends not to know anything and doesn't do anything. And the same thing with whole societies. You know, when these processes begin in another country, there could be non-military, non-violent engagements of different kinds that could halt those processes so that they don't develop. So there are many elements, many things that we can do in order to prevent evil. Even well, it's not something that individuals and societies that are inherent by their nature to individuals and societies. Well, let me just end this segment uh, just asking a, a question uh, in a, a different uh, aspect. I, I grew up uh, in New York City, and uh, I grew up in an area where there were a lot of people who were in the American mafia. And so I know about these people and, and social conditions and whatnot. And I don't know if Hitler himself ever killed anyone by his own hand. Uh, maybe he shot someone and killed someone in World War One. I'm not. I'm not certain. I know. I know Stalin had killed people and shot people to death. But isn't there a difference between someone like Hitler, who is killing, is at the top of a hierarchical structure, and says to his underlings, "Well." This underling, you tell your underling to tell your underling to tell your underling to kill someone. And someone who is, say, a sexual psychopath, like a Jack the Ripper type or a 
uh, Ted Bundy or uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. Um, is there, no matter what social conditions, isn't there something that's wrong with those individuals deep inside? And yes, you could say their mother abused them or their father left them or whatnot. But isn't isn't the difference between a Hitler and a Jack the Ripper somewhat different? Yes, I, I think that I, that is absolutely true. And there is also a difference between the people on the top who lead a movement and then the direct perpetrators yeah. who engage in violence. And we need to understand the psychology and the influences on both of these kinds of people. And certainly this is also the case with a uh, and this is very much the case with people who engage in serial killing, you know, mass killing, uh, do horrible things. You know, people who take three women and imprison them in a basement for many years yeah. you know, and hold them as slaves there and sexual slaves and slaves in every sense of the world. So these 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 individual perpetrators, their influences are different and uh, I don't know as much about them as yeah. I know about all the other kinds of violence. And it is possible that some of them, there have been some kind of brain abnormalities that have been identified that sometimes in very rare instances, I would emphasize in very rare instances, contribute to violence. But it can also be the case that, and I think it is the case, that these people often have extremely screwy, if I may use that <laughs> word, uh, childhood experiences. Yeah. You know, really weird, screwy, inappropriate, problematic childhood experiences. Uh, you know, associating uh, some experiences with a parent uh, with sexuality yeah. and, and then engaging in extreme sexual abuse and so on. And, you know, we have to study this and identify this and see if there is anything other than this experiential element, if there is any kind of genetic component or brain component. I differentiate it in genetic and brain component because the brain component could be some kind of a brain damage also, uh, while the genetic component may be some combination of genes that some way make the likelihood of, 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 uh, of violence more likely. There is research that shows that there, there is a little bit of hereditary component to some kinds of violence and also there is a little bit of just a small amount of hereditary component to a greater inclination to uh, to caring and helping. Uh, you know the hereditary component could be even temperamental. We know that temperament is partly genetic and what is temperament? For example, children with different temperaments can have different activity level. Uh, people, the early research on temperament talked about difficult children who would be very reactive and very responsive and so on. So you get a reactive child, temperamentally reactive child, into an environment that is not in any way respectful and responsive to this temperament, and there is harsh engagement immediately with that child responding to his temperament, and there can be a cycle of increasing the negativity and increasing expression of this active temperament in violent and harmful ways. So there are many possible avenues towards the possibility that some people become individually violent. All right, well, let's uh, end this sec uh, second segment, and uh, I want to end the interview, just give you a few moments uh, to talk about uh, uh, any closing thoughts you have. And we'll do that when we return. Well, I'm wrapping up this interview with Urban Staub about the nature of evil. We've talked about uh, political evil. We've talked about the possible uh, where evil comes from. Uh, so I'd like to just give uh, my uh, interviewees uh, a few minutes to talk uh, about whatever they want at the end of an interview. So if you have any uh, summary thoughts about it or anything that uh, you want to say, uh, please do so. Well, uh, I, I don't. You know, I, I 
know, I think that maybe if, if that's okay, I would like to talk a little bit about a political situation right now and, okay. uh, and maybe even conditions in the world. Go ahead. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's really sad uh, what some of the candidates for president the visions that they hold, uh, you know, they talking about respect for everybody. Uh, there is very little in the platform of a number of the candidates that shows respect for everybody, uh, and some of this disrespect is very much out in the open. You know, very clear, very direct. You know, all Mexicans are rapists, and uh, and so on. Uh, but there is, polit there are political positions in which there is nothing like this directly stated, but also doesn't show caring about people in the whole country. Doesn't really embrace the country as a whole. Uh, is not co doesn't concern itself with. The great poverty of many people, uh, you know, doesn't concern itself with the unequal justice that is so evident in our society. You know, the the you know police behavior, uh, which can be changed. You know, I have worked uh, in in California. Uh, in, in, after the Rodney King incident, the state of California invited me to propose a, a program for uh, police in California, for all the training of police in California to reduce unnecessary violence. And I did do that, focus on active bystandership. And there are others now that try to do that. So these things are not inevitable. We can create a caring society uh, which embraces the rights and offers respect for everyone and considers the needs of people. And one of those, one of the ways that you know it creates change is enablement, enabling people to take care of themselves, to support their families, to do well in the world, uh, enabling them through skills and enabling them through emotional capacities. Uh, but that means that, you know, I, I think I said this before, that you know, people who don't make enough money to provide for their families, people who are concerned about, you know, what they are going to do, it affects their self-respect, it affects their you know, emotional space to provide care for their children and to provide positive socialization. So we need to change institutions and conditions that enable everybody to be a full participant in society. And, you know, this, this is really crucial. And, you know, the other thing is, if I can go way aside, you know, we have participated in the United States in so many wars, and so many of these have been losing wars. We lost in Vietnam. We essentially lost in Iraq. We are losing in Afghanistan. And so the question is, can we approach the world in a different way? Now, Americans likes to say, love to say, we are the best country in the world and we are the most moral people in the world. Well, the fact is, the world needs the United States to provide moral leadership. But moral leadership requires moral example. So, in fact, you know, things like the Iran agreement, agreement with Iran about nuclear weapons is an example of diplomacy that from my perspective does provide a moral example and so many people are against it. Uh, so the thing is, uh, I'm talking in very general terms, but all of these require underlying 
policy choices and policy decisions and creating a caring society internally, a society in which we do cooperate with each other, a society in which we do value everybody and rather than negative value on some groups of people, we put positive value on everybody, where we propagate inclusive caring on the part of children and in institutions and in the society. And we can create such a society, it's possible. We made a very good beginning to create social change through the civil rights movement. What did that require? It required movement or influence from the bottom up. Many people participated and engaged. It, it required actions in the middle. And, and leaders of various uh, churches and, uh, and, and, uh, and, all, and the media who all participated in promoting it. And it required influence from the top. Our government finally took significant action in preventing violence and promoting uh, change in universities and schools. So, and then what happened? It stopped. And we had a reversal. Why did it stop? Because our attention wandered. I think the Vietnam War was a very important contributor to this change. So, it is possible, though, for people in general, for people in the middle, so to speak, the media and church leaders and influential public figures and leaders from the top to all move together to create a society of caring and cooperation. And what a wonderful country we could create. You know, all our political leaders say, you know, Donald Trump said, we are going to create the best society and we are going to be better than ever. Yes, let's try to be as good as we possibly can, but not, I think, the way they advocate, by creating equal justice for all, by creating just social engagement, by creating a society of caring, even a society of healing. You know, people who have had painful experiences in the past, who have feel victimized, see the world as dangerous and are likely to react hostily to many things. If we create a society in which there are opportunities for people to heal, not necessarily by going to therapists, but by the way we interact with each other, by the way we listen to each other, by the way we support each other. You know, single mothers, when they have support from other people in the community, are much better socializers for their children. They are much less likely to be abusive or negative. So supporting each other in many different ways and creating institutions that provide support are all crucially important to create a really good, caring society and to enable America to provide moral leadership in the world. Well, I've been talking with Irvin Staub about the nature of evil, and if you've enjoyed the conversation with him, I'll have a link below this video to his website, his website uh, and you can look at his books, uh, read his website, read some of this stuff online. I want to thank you for the time that you spent and your insights. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I, I really appreciate it and I enjoyed it.